Good evening, everyone. Uh, so nice to see all of you here uh, tonight. It's, uh, it's uh, great to have you here. Uh, my name is uh, Rick Locke. I'm a professor of political science and international public affairs and currently serve uh, as uh, provost. And I want to thank you all for being here uh, for tonight's uh, lecture, which is part of the series uh, Reaffirming University Values, Campus Dialogue and Discourse. Now, this uh, initiative is sponsored by the Office of the President as well as the Provost and includes an engagement of many others, many in the room, um, who have helped uh, put together and advise us on this uh, series. Uh, different academic departments, different uh, centers, uh, and uh, the division of uh, campus life. Now, through this series, uh, what we're seeking to do is basically apply rigorous scholarship and engage in thoughtful, informed discourse around society's most pressing uh, challenges. Uh, we also hope to provide the tools to empower our community to do this in a meaningful and productive way, uh, not only for ourselves in these very kind of tense uh, times, but also for generations uh, to come. And this is, of course, is what we're all about. This is our core uh, as, uh, as a university and what we seek to do well and what we must do well if we're going to honor our core. Now, essential to this understanding, the very context in which we fulfill our mission as an institution of higher education and the origins of the principles around which we've been founded is things like freedom of conscience, independent thought, and freedom of expression. These are core to what it means to be a university, what it means to be this university. And over the last uh, several years, the role of freedom of speech has been raised as both essential to our mission, which it is, and also under siege. Uh, that academic freedom, freedom of thought, and freedom of expression are often used interchangeably and talked about as absolutes. Yet we know that there are limits, such as speech intended to promote imminent danger, or a libelous speech. It is often framed in very stark and pronounced ways, yet we know that even the Supreme Court grapples with conflicting views on the First Amendment. Today, to help us sort through all of this and to understand the origins and expanse of freedom of speech in the context of universities, we have brought one of our nation's top scholars of the field, of, uh, of, in the field of free speech, uh, Robert uh, Post. Robert Post is dean and also the Saul and Lillian Goldman Professor of Law at Yale Law, Law School. Uh, and Dean Post's academic interests include constitutional law, First Amendment, legal history, and equal protection. He has written and edited numerous books and journal articles, which are listed in your program, including Citizens Divided, A Constitutional Theory of Campaign Finance Reform, a work that Justice Stephen Breyer cited even before its publication in the dissent of the 2014 campaign finance case. Post received his bachelor's degree from Harvard as well as his PhD in the history of American civilization from Harvard. And between these two degrees, he earned his law degree uh, at Yale. So, uh, you know, pretty, uh, pretty busy uh, person um, in the, in the uh, 1970s. Uh, and uh, upon graduating from Yale, he clerked uh, for chief judge of DC Circuit uh, David Bazelon and for Supreme Court Justice William Brennan, Jr. Post then worked briefly in private practice before starting his career teaching law at Berkeley Law School. And then he moved to Yale in 2003 and was appointed to the dean of the law school in 2009. In addition to his exceptional scholarship, uh, Dean Post is also a masterful teacher. According to one student enrolled in the First Amendment course he teaches to third year law students, quote unquote, most First Amendment law professors expect students to learn and apply the doctrine or legal rules developed by the Supreme Court. Post's aim is more ambitious, to show that the doctrine itself is often incompatible with the values underlying our commitment to free speech. As we undertake our own efforts here on campus to explore both the roots as well as the origins of our guiding principles as we ourselves as a community wrestle with these issues of how to be a truly inclusive but also inclusive in all sense uh, uh, community we are so fortunate to have with us today uh, Robert Post. Thank you Robert for coming. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Rick. It's a pleasure um, to be here um, at this wonderful university. Um, I am um, I'm going to talk to you today about freedom of speech um, and the university. And when we in the United States speak about freedom of speech, we paradigmatically have in mind the great decisions of the Supreme Court of the United States, which you referenced, which talk about freedom of speech. The first and most important of which is the dissent by Oliver Wendell Holmes in a case called Abrams versus United States. And Holmes said, and I'm quoting him now, but when men have realized that time has upset many fighting faiths, they may come to believe even more than they believe the very foundations of their own conduct that the ultimate good desired is better reached by free trade in ideas, that the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market, and that truth is the only ground upon which their wishes safely can be carried out. That, at any rate, is the theory of our Constitution. It is an experiment as all life is an experiment. That's the classic marketplace of ideas theory, roots going back to John Stuart Mill, that Holmes articulates in 1919. And Holmes put it again in a case called Schwimmer versus United States. He put that in 1929. He said, if there is any principle of the Constitution that more imperatively calls for attachment than any other, it is the principle of free thought, not free thought for those who agree with us, but freedom for the thought that we hate. Holmes very famously said that. And those eloquent pronouncements are immediately attractive. It's hard not to be inspired when you hear someone uh, say that. And it's very hard not to assimilate those ideals to the university. We think our universities should have equivalent ideals to those that Holmes articulated. So just to give you a simple and obvious example, the first and I think most influential of all the reports about freedom of speech in the universities is the so-called Woodward Report, which was issued at Yale in 1974. It sets the official policy, so-called official policy of Yale University to this day. And it begins precisely citing that quote from Schwimmer that I read to you, freedom of expression for those ideas that we hate. And then it goes on to say, and I'm quoting now from the Woodward Report, a commitment to the principle of freedom of expression and its superior importance to other laudable principles and values, to the duty of all members of the university community to defend the right to speak and refrain from disruptive interference. That's the key value, says the Woodward Report. The report concedes, quoting, we take a chance, as the First Amendment takes a chance, when we commit ourselves to the idea that the results of free expression are to the general benefit in the long run, but the Woodward Report argues that such a commitment is necessary because, quote, the primary function of a university is to discover and disseminate knowledge by means of research and teaching, and to fulfill this function, a free interchange of ideas is necessary. And in a very famous and eloquent passage that's often recited, the report looks squarely into the abyss, and it does not blink. It states, and I'm quoting, the university is not, is not primarily a fellowship, a club, a circle of friends. Without sacrificing its central purpose, it cannot make its primary and dominant value the fostering of friendship, solidarity, harmony, civility, or mutual respect. To be sure, these are important values, but as important as they are, they cannot override a university's central purpose. We value freedom of expression precisely because it provides a forum for the new, the provocative, the disturbing, and the unorthodox. Freedom of speech is a barrier to the tyranny of authoritarian or even majority opinion as to the rightness or wrongness of particular doctrines or thoughts. Now, I would say that's probably the most influential passage of any university freedom of speech uh, report. You saw it echoed if you followed the recent uh, Jeff Stone statement for the University of Chicago, which was reenacted by the faculty um, at Princeton. In point of fact, these premises are widely shared. Um, so, of course, what am I going to do today? I am going to argue that they're misplaced. They actually do not understand the way we regulate speech in a university, and that um, the premises of the Woodward Report are 
mistaken. That's going to be my thesis today. I'm going to be quite heterodox. So I know that sounds kind of paradoxical. Uh, and to begin to establish it, I think we need to be pretty clear about what we mean by um, freedom of speech. Uh, because we can't say we have it or we don't have it unless we know actually what we're talking about when we say this is freedom of speech, this is not freedom of speech. So let's take the basic prerequisites of freedom of speech as the American First Amendment um, establishes it. Now remember, the Woodward Report is citing First Amendment opinions. And when you see uh, these recent uh, statements of freedom of speech in a university, they are citing too. They are evoking First Amendment jurisprudence, the very cases that I've uh, read to you from. So if we talk about that jurisprudence, there are many rules, many, many, many rules that define freedom of speech. In fact, our First Amendment jurisprudence has been compared to the tax code because of its proliferation of doctrines and rules and principles, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm going to take the three, let's say, just the three most important ones. If you don't have these rules, you do not have freedom of speech in the way that our United States Supreme Court defines it. So rule number one, you can't have content discrimination. You can't distinguish between speakers based on what they want to say. Um, you can't say to a speaker, you have to speak on this topic, but not on that topic. No content discrimination, rule number one. Rule number two, there are no true or false opinions for purposes of the false amendment, for First Amendment. So all ideas within our First Amendment jurisprudence, qua ideas, are equal, or as the court has many times said, there are no false ideas for purposes of the First Amendment. So second is all ideas are equal, no false ideas. And third basic rule, this is just the most elementary rules of First Amendment jurisprudence. Third rule, the state cannot compel you to speak. No for, no for speech. This goes back, you might remember the Barnett case where a Jehovah's Witness child didn't want to salute the flag and the court says if there's one fixed star, you can't compel someone to swear allegiance to what they actually don't believe, uh, 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 to believe it. They can't compel them to say one thing or another. These are, these are just basic fundamental rules. Now, consider these three rules in a very common situation. I want to be as ordinary as I can. You go to your doctor and you ask your doctor's advice. And your doctor um, uh, gives you advice, which turns out to be really awful advice. Your doctor says, you actually don't have cancer. You don't need to get treatment. But in fact, you do have cancer, and you do need to get treatment. So you want to sue your doctor. You want to sue your doctor for malpractice. Malpractice law requires your doctor to give you competent advice. So I've just given you a hypothetical where you're suing your doctor for words, advice given or not given. That's the whole basis of this suit that I've just postulated for you. Do the three rules of freedom of speech apply? Can malpractice law apply content discrimination to your doctor? You asked your doctor about treatment, and your doctor, let's say, wants to talk about shoe leather. Of course your doctor has to talk about the content that's on the table between you, his patient, and the doctor. What about false ideas? No such thing as a false idea. Of course there's such a thing as bad advice for a doctor, otherwise there wouldn't be medical malpractice laws. What about compelled to speech? What about compelled speech? Your doctor has to tell you the appropriate advice. You compel, your doctor is compelled to speech. So we violated each of the most fundamental rules of freedom of speech if we're to apply malpractice law. So can your doctor, when you sue your doctor for malpractice, say, oh no, freedom of speech, I was just talking, my advice to you was an experiment, as all life is an experiment. <laughs> I, I don't think we'd say such a thing. We wouldn't have medical malpractice laws if we could say such a thing. Right. So what do we learn from that simple, ordinary um, example? Well, I think it tells us something about what freedom of speech, where it applies, and where it doesn't. So Aristotle tells us that we're all talking animals. And that means that everything we do, we do through communication. That's what differentiates us from most animals. We do it by talking, as to say, by communicating ideas, by speech. And if all speech were to be protected simply because we're speaking, 
all forms of behavior would be free from regulation. To regulate behavior is to regulate the speech that goes along with that behavior. And that's what I've just shown you with the example of the doctors. If we want to regulate medical practice, we have to regulate the speech that goes along with that practice. Or to take it closer to my home, lawyers, right? Lawyers give you speech. They give you opinions. They give you advice. If I couldn't regulate legal malpractice by regulating the speech of lawyers, I couldn't regulate what lawyers do, period, end of story. Or um, take the army, right? The army has to regulate the behavior of soldiers. The, the captain says to the private, I want you to go up to that hill. And the private says, no, I want to talk about it. Doesn't get to happen, does it? I mean, if you're going to regulate behavior in the military, you're regulating speech in the military. And that is true just about everywhere you look. If you're in a courtroom, people don't have freedom of speech. Their speech is highly regulated. If you're in a workplace, your speech is regulated as your behavior is regulated. If you're in an administrative agency, your speech is regulated um, uh, as your behavior. Or to put the thing most crudely, every time you sign a contract, you're talking speech. You're talking words on a page. And whenever you regulate contracts like price controls or what you have to disclose in a rental lease, you're regulating speech. You couldn't regulate contracts if the three rules that I just described to you were to apply, even though it's words on a page and it's speech. Right? So if you think about what I've just said, you'll see that in our culture, freedom of speech is actually the exception. It's not the rule. And that's a very simple point, but it actually has very profound consequences. One consequence is you cannot think of a theory of freedom of speech in general. There's no trans-substantive theory of freedom of speech because the speech is going to go into all kinds of social context where we will want to regulate behavior. And these three rules that I just set out to you would have no um, application. That's a very profound point, because lots of times you'll hear people say, I'm speaking, therefore freedom of speech. Can't be true if what I've just said to you is, is right. And yet, it is intelligible in the First Amendment context to speak about freedom of speech. We know what we mean when we say these three rules in the context of freedom. And um, why is that? Well, I think that's true, um, because we have particular reasons why we protect speech in certain contexts where First Amendment jurisprudence should apply. And um, we could talk about this in the discussion afterwards, and there are many reasons why that might be true. But um, I I'm just going to assert them now, and we can talk more about the reasoning behind them um, later. I think you'll find that we have freedom of speech in the United States, and you can read this back. You can reverse engineer it from the shape of our First Amendment doctrine. We have freedom of speech because we want to govern ourselves in a democracy. So what does it mean to govern ourselves in a democracy? It means we govern ourselves. But what does it mean to govern ourselves? I didn't agree with anything that just happened in this election. Right? Um, I'm like in despair as a result of this election. How am I governing myself when I lose the election? I'm a minority, not a majority. Where am I governing myself? It must be the case that I can intelligibly say I live in a democracy even though I've lost the election and I'm a minority in this case because there's something that leads me to identify with the country despite losing an election. So democracy is, first of all, not just about votes. It's about identifying with the processes of decision making behind the votes. And the way we talk about that is identifying with the processes by which public opinion is formed. James Bryce talked about this at the end of the 19th century. He said, the United States is a very strange country. It's government by public opinion. And public opinion doesn't exist just at times of election. It always exists. So the argument goes roughly like this. The sense of things go roughly like this. I participate in the speech designed to form public opinion. I believe, I have reason to believe, or I'm confident that the government is more or less responsive to public opinion. Hence, the government is more or less responsive to me. So freedom of speech serves in the United States the value of democratic legitimation. 
It makes me believe I can participate in ways in which the government might be responsive to me. That's a necessary but not sufficient condition for democratic <coughs> self-governance in the United States. If I couldn't speak, if I couldn't form part of public opinion, I would have no reason to accept the result of this election, much less the next election. So if you look at the way First Amendment jurisprudence is formed, it applies to those forms of speech, those speech acts by which we as a society um, form public opinion, and not to other speech acts like medical advice, which are not viewed as part of public opinion formation, or speech acts in a court of law, or speech acts in the military, or speech acts in a workplace. We don't view that as part of public opinion. We could, but we don't. And so we allow speech there to be regulated in ways that we do not permit, I'm going to call it public discourse, public discourse to be regulated. And public discourse are those set of speech acts which as a society we deem necessary for the formation of public opinion. And why is it um, that these three rules apply? Well, we can think about it very simply. Rule one, content discrimination. This means that the state can't decide what public opinion should be about. That's what content discrimination is doing. It means you get to shape, you, the citizen, get to shape the content of public opinion. The state can't shape the parameters of public opinion. That's what the rule against content discrimination is about. What about the rule against, um, uh, rule saying there's no such thing as a false idea? Well, that rule says that everyone is entitled to their own opinion. Why is everyone entitled to their own opinion? Because as democratic citizens, we are all equal. So at the root of this idea that there's no such thing as a false opinion is a political notion of equality. It's not an epistemic notion of equality, which suggests that the First Amendment is not about epistemic matters. It's about political equality and legitimation. And, um, and for that reason, fools and philosophers equally can speak in public discourse. And the state can't say, you're an idiot, you have to shut up. Can't do that. Everyone gets their own opinion insofar as they're politically equal. And the third uh, rule, which says the state can't compel you to speak, remember the ultimate value served by freedom of speech is democratic legitimation. I get to have the opportunity to believe that the state is potentially responsive to me. If the state is making me talk, I lose that. Because by hypothesis, it's making me say things I don't want to say. It's making me participate in the formation of public opinion in ways that I wouldn't otherwise want to do. And that interrupts the creation of the very value that we use, the First Amendment, to create the value of democratic legitimation. So that's why we have these three rules. That's why they apply to a very specific set of speech acts, the speech acts we deem necessary to uh, create public opinion. And let me give you just a simple example of how this plays out in real life in First Amendment jurisprudence. So you all know Dr. Oz, do you? You know, that's the doctor that has the TV program, all right? So Dr. Oz, let's just say he has two roles. I'm assuming he's actually a real doctor. So sometimes he's actually talking to a patient, and sometimes he's on TV telling you to take green coffee to what, lose weight? What does green coffee do? It does something special for you. Right? He's doing these two things for you, uh, Dr. Oz. So insofar as he's a doctor and he's telling his patients to take green coffee, he could be subject to malpractice. We will regulate his speech. But insofar as he's on TV speaking to the public sphere as someone who's forming public opinion and not a doctor talking to a patient, and a doctor talking to a patient, everyone isn't equal. We expect the patient to be uh, to be able to rely on the doctor and to be epistemically less reliable than the doctor. But insofar as he's talking in public, he's equal to everyone else, and he can say whatever crazy things he wants to say. And we can't hold him liable. Right? So the regulation of his speech depends upon the role in which he's speaking. He could say the same words in a different role, and we'd have different regimes of speech regulation for him. And we could even add another level of complexity if we wanted to. I'll just refer to it. Sometimes Dr. Oz on his program is actually selling you things. Right? That's, we call that in First Amendment jurisprudence commercial speech. So in commercial speech, you can say a lot of things. You get some protection, but you can't say misleading things. So if he's telling you this green coffee is going to cure your heart disease, he is going to be subject to, as he was subject to, investigation by the FTC.
But insofar as he's not selling you that and telling you, um, and telling you, you know, this is the cure for heart disease, uh, he would be privileged as a citizen to say that. And so once again, it depends on the role. It depends on our characterization, our normative characterization of the kind of um, speech act that Dr. Oz is engaged in. All right, so that's the basic uh, framework that I'm going to apply. Let me now apply that to the subject at hand, which is universities. So if the argument I've been making has any validity at all, um, it would follow that a university can regulate speech as is necessary to achieve the purposes of the university. That's what universities do. They're there to regulate, um, to regulate the behavior of people in the university to achieve the purposes of the university. And so then we have to say, well, what are those purposes? What kind of an institution is a university? There are theorists like Stanley Fish or Michael Oakeshott who will say, you can't, uh, universities don't have purposes. You know, they just exist and they float along and uh, tradition gives them and they are what they are. And it's not gonna be very helpful if we have to actually say how to regulate speech in university because here we have a decision. Do we regulate this speech or don't we? So we're gonna actually have to dig a little deeper than uh, simply say they are what they are. Um, I would say that two purposes that almost um, every university that I know uh, incorporates are one, research, or two, teaching. <clears throat> so if I look at Brown's mission statement, Brown's mission statement reads, the mission of Brown University is to serve the community, the nation, and the world by discovering, communicating, and preserving knowledge and understanding in a spirit of free inquiry and by educating and preparing students to discharge the offices of life with usefulness and reputation, right? That's a classic university mission statement. Cambridge University, University of California, any university that's worth its salt will say research and it'll say um, teaching. So let's look at each of those purposes. Let's look at the purpose of um, uh, research. There's some, there was uh, in the 19th century some debate about whether universities should engage in the purpose of research. So you might remember Cardinal John Henry Newman, right? What is the, the idea of the university, 1852? He writes this, he says, um, a university, uh, he says that a university should be a place of teaching university knowledge. And he says, this implies that the object of the university is, on the one hand, intellectual, not moral, and on the other, that it is the diffusion and extension of knowledge rather than the advancement. If its object were scientific and philosophical discovery, I do not see why a university should have students, says Newman, right? So it's against the research function of the university. But modern universities coming out of the Wissenschaft, uh, Wissenschaftliche uh, tradition of Germany disagreed with Newman. We're here to, as you say in your mission statement at Brown, advance uh, knowledge. And one way we do that is we tend to distinguish between graduate education, undergraduate education. Undergraduate education tends to be promoted toward teaching, graduate education toward the expansion of knowledge. But however we think about it, um, discovering new knowledge is a purpose of any great modern American um, university. So how do we do that and what does that imply for the regulation of speech? within the university. Ralph Derendorf once observed that discovering new knowledge requires us, I'm quoting him now, to maintain the conditions of rational critical discourse in which it is possible to disagree. Since nobody knows all the answers, let us, let us make sure above all that it remains possible to give different answers. That seems entirely plausible. You can't advance knowledge unless you can disagree with the knowledge that you've been given. Otherwise, you're stuck. You're stuck with just repeating what you've been um, told. And that's a very simple thought that seems to me quite, um, quite right. And it follows from that observation that if you want to advance knowledge, you have to have a lot of tolerance of disagreement and a certain degree of ability to take in um, critique. And it's on that notion of being able to take in critique that the marketplace of ideas theory that I started with from Holmes is based. And often in the world of First Amendment jurisprudence, it's said that the function of the marketplace of ideas is to create truth. The freer the speech, the more truth you have. That's the way in which it's um, often put, that it leads right to truth. And what I'm gonna say to you now is I think that's exactly uh, not true. <laughs> I 
So I just want to consider, consider three things. Consider um, the three doctrinal rules that we started with to define freedom of speech in the context of research. So first rule, no content discrimination. Well, if we're talking about the research function of a university, is there really no content discrimination? We give grants for one subject rather than another subject. We give tenure for one field rather than another field. We, uh, we organize teaching and curriculum about one thing. We hire in one area rather than another area. Or think about the second rule, no such thing as a false idea. All ideas are equal. That's not how we advance knowledge in a university. We advance knowledge in a university by making judgments all the time, and necessarily we make judgments of competence. We say some ideas are better than others. That's how we decide who to tenure. That's how we decide who to hire. That's how we decide who to give grants to. If we couldn't make these judgments of quality, we couldn't be a university. Another way to put that is if there's no such thing as a false idea, there can be no such thing as a true idea. And if there can be no such thing as a true idea, you can't have knowledge. So the second rule doesn't work, obviously. What about no speech is compelled? Do you ever hear publish or perish? <laughs> of course we compel speech all the time. Go teach, go publish your articles. Why is that? Because the university certifies experts. And how do we certify experts? We certify them by making them talk and see whether they say competent things. We compel speech all the time in universities. So the three rules that describe freedom of speech in the context of research, none of them apply to university in the context of research. So something is seriously um, wrong here. And why is that? What's, what's, what's going wrong here? Well, what's going wrong is that the function of a university is not to create democratic legitimation. The function of a university, as we've just defined it, is to create new knowledge. These are different functions. And so they require different forms of regulating speech. So what sort of new knowledge does a university create? It's not charismatic knowledge. It's not the kind of knowledge that a novelist creates, typically, or an artist. Um, creates, nor is it the kind of knowledge that you might say is immediate sensual knowledge. I know I'm sitting in a room because I see you all. The kind of knowledge which university create is what we might call um, expert knowledge. Right? So how do we know that smoking causes cancer? It's not a matter of immediate sensual apprehension. It's not a matter of charisma. It's a matter of public health science. Right? What, is pub what do we mean when we say public health science? What we mean is that there are disciplines of statistics and of public health. They conduct kinds of experiments. They begin to tell us how to determine whether cigarettes cause cancer. I can smoke all I want. I won't know it. I have to appeal to these modes of knowing. What are these modes of knowing? These are communities of knowledge that over time develop practices which are reproduced in the university that grow, that expand, but that are always, as Tom Haskell would say, in a community of knowing that is not equal. It's hierarchical. There are better and worse ways of knowing within the community of um, knowledge. Um, and that's why, you know, if we have a community of of, of, climate, uh, of climate scientists who tell us there's global warming and somebody has an insight from God that says, you know, the warming that's happening is God's breath on the earth, as John Stewart would say, we don't believe that person is having knowledge. What counts as having knowledge is that the people who understand the communities of knowledge, the disciplinary work of climatology, applying the, the protocols of their disciplines validate that as knowledge. That's the best we can do by way of knowing anything, by way of knowing um, um, expert knowledge. So what we're saying is the kind of knowledge, when we're talking about university research and expanding knowledge, is uh, resting on a disciplinary hierarchy, which is exactly the opposite of the democratic equality on which freedom of speech rests. That's a huge, important point, and that's why the marketplace of ideas doesn't work. So if any of you edited a scientific magazine, you will know that you don't do it on the form of the marketplace of ideas. You don't come first, first, first come, first serve, it gets published. You make evaluations, better, worse. This is exactly what the marketplace of ideas is supposed to tell you. You're not supposed to do, right? No place in the world that actually makes what we call expert knowledge functions on a marketplace of ideas um, theory. Now, 
It is also the case that disciplines grow, they change, they expand, they learn, which means you need a lot of room for dissent. But what makes it interesting is when you dissent within a discipline, you first have to be literate within a discipline and make the dissent in a way that's intelligible to people who already know the discipline. That's the important point. So you have continuity within the discipline and change um, within the discipline. So disciplines are committed to progress, which means they must have dissent. But unlike classic principles of freedom of speech, they don't have only dissent. They have dissent, which is constantly evaluated by the rules already existing within the community of knowledge that constitutes the discipline. Disciplines that do not encourage internal criticism risk atrophy and death. But disciplines that are not bound by internal uh, that do not have internal criticism, that don't evaluate according to standards of competence, risk disintegration and incoherence. That's the paradox that any discipline lives in. That's the paradox that the university um, lives in. That's a tough paradox to be in. But that's where we are in a university. In no, in no shape or form could that be described merely as freedom of speech in the way um, in which I was describing it. And the way you can see that is no university could function were it entirely open. That is to say, anything goes, anybody gets tenure, first come, first serve, and then we're, uh, then we're, you know, we're booked up, then we have to wait for somebody to die. That's not the way we work. We decide whose work is actually good, and then we give tenure to those people. That itself is inconsistent with freedom of um, speech. We're in an unstable territory. We've got to get um, used to it. So the marketplace of ideas theory is really very bad description of universities, and as is the idea of freedom of speech. What's a good description of it? Um, here I'm going to quote from uh, what I think is probably <clears throat> the best description I know of. It's the 1915 Declaration of Principles of Academic Freedom of the um, American Association of University Professors. This was. Uh, this was uh, uh, created in the first year of the association, and it's written by great figures like John Dewey, who was at the time president, and um, it defines academic freedom as the freedom to pursue the scholar's profession according to the standards of that profession. The declaration asserts, and I'm quoting it now, the liberty of the scholar within the university to set forth his conclusions, be they what they may, is conditioned by their being conclusions gained by a scholar's method and held in a scholar's spirit. That is to say, they must be the fruits of competent and patient and sincere inquiry. And the declaration says, academic freedom upholds, and here's the crucial language, I'm quoting, not the absolute freedom of utterance of the individual scholar, not the absolute freedom of utterance of the individual scholar, but the absolute freedom of thought, of inquiry, of discussion, and of teaching of the academic profession. It's the profession which has the freedom. Now, we, we're so involved in individual rights, we don't really have the conceptual apparatus to know what it means to talk about a profession having freedom. So first, let me say, if we're going to have knowledge that's validated by the standards of the profession, there is no other institution in the United States that produces those standards other than the university. Right? Knowledge is produced by Xerox and by AT&T, but the standards that validates that knowledge as knowledge comes out of the university, university departments, professional societies, which in turn are dependent on universities. We are a unique institution because our, um, our fidelity our, our loyalty is to the disciplinary standards which define what knowledge um, is. So that's, that's our essence. And let me give you an example of what, what this actually concretely means. So let's take a young professor. A young professor doesn't get tenure. A young professor sues the university in a court of law and says, I was denied tenure for the wrong reasons. My freedom of speech was denied. My, it was because of this or that or the other. They disagreed with me, et cetera. They didn't, my, my research angered the major donors. That's why they denied me, et cetera. So we have a case. What is a court actually going to decide? How is it going to handle this case? So let's say the court determines that the refusal to deny, the refusal to give tenure is justified by disciplinary standards. 
in which case the court will reverse the judgment of the university. Let's say the court decides that the refusal to give tenure was not justified by disciplinary standards, in which case the court will award tenure. So what is that telling you? The court's actually enforcing the disciplinary standards of competence by which the university pursues its mission of um, research. That's what that's telling you. That's the essence of what the protections are about. That's what they should be about, um, given our analysis. OK, so if, that, if we take that back to the Woodward Report, of course, just to tell you, I mean, all this high-flying rhetoric, um, we do not value. <laughs> I'm just reading you now from the Woodward Report where we start. We do not value freedom of expression precisely because it provides a forum for the new, the provocative, the disturbing, and the unorthodox. We don't do that. We value freedom of expression because it advances research. It advances knowledge. That's why we value freedom of expression. Totally different form of analysis in the context of the goal of research. Okay, so let's take a different goal. Let's take the other goal that universities universally put forward, um, teaching. Extremely important goal. Does that goal require freedom of speech? The goal of teaching students um, and making them uh, mature in their thinking. So in, to, to unpack that problem, I need to give you some sense of what it actually means to educate someone. And I could frame this really precisely. I see that there are a number of professors in the audience uh, here, and I want to ask you, um, if you've ever taught a classroom where it was conducted like a Hyde Park corner or like a public forum where anybody could say anything whenever they wanted about any subject. I I've never taught a class like that, ever. You know, um, in, in my class, students talk when they're called upon about the subject that we're discussing in a certain kind of order, and they treat each other with respect. That's what they do in my class. And why is that? Because I believe they learn better if they treat each other with respect. Because my object here is not freedom of expression. My object is not to be democratically equal between students and professors and me in some large sense. My object is to educate students. So the question is, what furthers that um, object? So let's take this notion of respect, because that's a quite, a, quite an important one. I'm teaching a course, let's say, on feminism in uh, Virginia Woolf. Would the class be more or less education, educational if students could call each other names or speak the way Trump speaks in that recorded thing? I, I don't think so. I, I don't think that would conduce to the educational atmosphere of the classroom. And I think any teacher knows that. Any teacher knows that students who are threatened or assaulted don't listen. They don't learn. So you have to create the conditions under which learning is uh, possible. And you have to regulate the speech in order to advance that possible, that, that, um, um, that goal. And that's why if you look, for example, at parliamentary debates in Great Britain or in the Congress of the United States, there are all sorts of rules. And one of those rules is you have to be civil. In every, in every parliamentary body that I know, you, you can't just get up there and say whatever you want. You have to speak in a respectful way. You can't demean the great senator from South Carolina or whatever else um, because the debate is more likely to be functional, more likely to achieve its purpose of reaching agreement or persuasion if people treat each other with respect. And I don't know of any teacher who wouldn't do the same thing in their classroom. So procedurally, there's lots of rules um, in the class. Um, all, the, all the simple rules that I've defined by freedom of speech, none of them apply in a classroom. So take uh, content discrimination. If I'm teaching a class on, the constitu on constitutional law and a student wants to talk about a football game, no, doesn't happen. You have to talk about this content, not that content. Right? Um, second rule, the quality of all ideas. If I have a student who <laughs> doesn't get it, um, they get graded. Every grade is an evaluation of the quality of an idea, the competence of an idea. Um, and that's inconsistent with um, freedom of speech, but I'm giving them feedback about how to think better, and that's my job in educating them. Third rule, no compelled speech. What classroom have you been in where there's no compelled speech, where you don't get called on, where the object of engaging in a dialogue is often facilitated by precisely 
engagements which are not entirely voluntary. They're involuntary because they're voluntary because you agreed to take the class, but then I call on you and you, you have to respond on penalty of not responding in the, in the class. And why, are, why do we do this? Because we view it as appropriate and necessary for the goal of um, educating, um, educating uh, students. So what about my freedom of speech as a teacher? Do I have freedom to say whatever I want um, in the classroom? So let's, that depends on what we mean by teaching from the university's point of view. If the university says teaching is the transmission of accurate and appropriate knowledge, then of course I can be regulated because if I'm giving incompetent information, if I'm teaching that the Holocaust didn't happen or the American Constitution was ratified in 1954, I'm going to be regulated in my classroom and appropriately so because I am not doing the purpose for which I've been hired, which is teaching um, students. So insofar as we conceive teaching as a transmission of knowledge, it's going to be subject to the standards of competence and none of the three rules that define freedom of speech would apply. But matter, there's something more to be said on that subject, however, because for many, and I think rightly so, education in higher education is not merely a matter of the transmission of knowledge. That may be true for K-12 or let's say K-4, but it's not true for higher education. And I don't want to um, go into this in too much detail, but if we go back to Cardinal Newman, who was after all a pretty wise man, he said the real function of education is what he called a real cultivation of mind. So Newman says this, he says, quote, when the intellect has once been properly trained and formed to have a connected view or grasp of things, it will display its powers with more or less effect according to its particular quality and capacity in the individual. In the case of most men, it makes itself felt in the good sense, sobriety of thought, reasonableness, candor, self-command, and steadiness of view, which characterize it. In some, it will have developed habits of business, power of influencing others, and sagacity. Sagacity. In others, it will elicit the talent of philosophical speculation and lead the mind forward to eminence in this or that intellectual department. In all, it will be a faculty of entering with comparative ease into any subject of thought and of taking up with aptitude any science or profession. That's how Newman defined what education, the function of higher education. So a slightly more modern, maybe 50 years more modern, take on that is the 1915 AAUP statement declaration. It states that the purpose of university education is not to provide students with ready-made conclusions, but to train them to think for themselves and to provide them access to those materials which they need if they are to think intelligently. Or in the Academic Personnel Manual of the University of California, it says the university seeks to foster in its students a mature independence of mind. That's the object of higher education, a mature independence of mind. And the University of California draws from this premise the conclusion, I'm quoting now the manual, this educational purpose cannot be achieved unless students and faculty are free within the classroom to express the widest range of viewpoints in accord with the standards of scholarly inquiry and professional ethics. So, in other words, certain conclusions about the freedom of expression within the classroom can be deduced if the mission of the university is not merely to transmit information, but also to instill habits of inquiry that are necessary to a real cultivation of mind. And specifically, the point here is that independence of mind can't be transmitted. It can't be handed off. It can't be given to a student. It has to be modeled. It has to be, um, you has to be seen in action, and a student has to take in that someone is actually exemplifying independence of mind. You have to exemplify it before a student can see what it means to be, have an independence of mind. So Richard Rorty puts it this way. He says, students need to have freedom enacted before their eyes by actual human beings if higher education is to achieve its purpose of being a provocation to self-creation. And that's because actually inspiring intellectual maturation depends upon the relationship between professors and students. And Newman perfectly well understood this. He said, 
quote, an academical system without the personal influence of teachers upon pupils is an arctic winter, he says. It will create an ice-bound, petrified, cast-iron university. Those are great metaphors. Ice-bound, petrified, cast-iron university and nothing else. And Richard Rorty, of course, in the 20th, 20th century puts it much sharper. He says, there has to be the erotic relationships between teachers and students celebrated by Socrates. He says, there has to be transference. In other words, you have to somehow identify with the professor, watch how the professor exemplifies independence, and want to model it um, yourself. Now, that has important implications, I think, for how communication in the classroom can be modeled if that's your function. If your function is to promote a certain kind of transference, a certain kind of modeling of the professor being independent. So the 1915 Declaration makes this explicit when it says, and I'm quoting, no man can be a successful teacher unless he enjoys the respect of his students and their confidence in his intellectual integrity. It is clear, however, that this confidence will be impaired if there is suspicion on the part of the student that the teacher is not expressing himself fully or frankly. It is not only the character of the instruction, but also the character of the instructor that counts. And if the student has reason to believe that the instructor is not true to himself, the virtue of the instruction as an educative force is incalculably diminished. And I think that's a really important argument. And it underwrites what, in the United States, we call freedom of teaching. That's a form of academic freedom. So I think what one has in the research is academic freedom, not freedom of expression. And what we have in the classroom is academic freedom of teaching. And this argument is what is used to defend the university from meddling in the classroom, saying, you ought to teach this, or you ought to teach it this way, or you ought to teach it that way. And the defense is, I have to establish a relationship with my students in which they trust me, and which they see me as an independent thinker. And once again, that puts us in the terrain of paradox. Because I have to be seen as independent, and yet I have to be confident. And yet I have to actually be educating my students. That is the difficulty um, involved in parsing what that freedom of teaching um, actually means. It doesn't mean you have freedom of expression. It means that we can judge your expression in light of this mission, which is a very delicate and very complex mission to both inspire your students to think for themselves and yet actually make them think for themselves and not bully them, not say whatever comes into your mind, be competent in what you transmit. That's the field, the complex, difficult field of, of academic freedom of teaching that we enter into. So um, what have I said to you? <clears throat> I said re the regulation of speech in the university has to be regulated in accordance with our understanding of the mission of the university. And there are different kinds of freedoms which are related to the two different major kinds of missions of a modern university, research on the one hand, teaching on the other. But in either case, these freedoms are conceptually distinct from the kind of freedom of speech which derives from the political arena where all are equal and all have to exist for the end of self-governance. The university is not about self-governance. The university is about the attainment of education or the attainment of um, knowledge. Now, having said this to you, of course, it doesn't diminish many of the controversies that occur about freedom of speech in university. It just says, what are the stakes and what are the tools that we have to bring to bear in order to solve them? So many of the controversies, when you think about it, about freedom of speech in a university happen in situations where it's not clear what, mis what mission the university is actually serving. So they happen in the context of honorary degrees or invited speakers. And to solve that problem, what you need to do is figure out why you're inviting the speaker. And who's inviting the speaker for what purpose and who's suppressing it for what purpose. These are all very contextual judgments that we have to parse on a case-by-case -case basis. But what I'm trying to give you is the tools to do that. Namely, how does it relate back to the mission of the university? And does it forward or not forward that? And what I can tell you with some assurance is to invoke abstract principles of freedom of speech, say the words freedom of speech, and reference our First Amendment, that's going to get you nothing but confusion. So that's what I have to tell you. So we have time for some questions. I'm going to ask you to use the microphone because there's overflow upstairs so people can hear. Do you want to make a list? <laughs> 
Robert, do you want me to? Uh, yeah, you should. You said David's coming. Thanks. That was really okay. Yeah. Um, thanks. I really enjoyed that. It's a really interesting analysis. Um, I have a question that, in one way, can be put kind of open ended, and that's and then and then maybe maybe a, a little more pointedly. The open ended one is on this analysis where what counts as freedom of speech in the university is driven by the mission of the university, and then more particularly by the standards of the relevant professions. It's hard to see how the First Amendment even given your political interpretation, let's say it's you, you know, primarily about public political discourse, does reach into the university at all. The doctrine is that it does, at least for public universities. And the question is, how could a university ever violate freedom of speech under that interpretation? So, one way, so that's an open, I'm sure there's a side to your view that must have a view about that. Yeah. A way to make it a little more pointed is you can imagine uh, standards of the profession or of a university emerging in such a way that a certain political viewpoint becomes no longer accepted by that profession. So suppose economics decides uh, anything that's not compatible with Marxist doctrine isn't up to date sufficient and we can't, can't have it expressed on campus anymore and rules are passed. Can the First Amendment go in and um, veto that professional standard? If so, how does the analysis hold up? Okay, so there's two parts of that. Of course, you know the First Amendment, qua First Amendment applies only to the state. So we're typically, we're typically talking about state universities when we're talking about this. And um, I would say that it applies to state universities exactly the way it applies to state prisons. That is to say, speech can be regulated to serve the function of the university. So suppose they don't tenure a Marxist, right? And then the court takes the case, and the court will ask, not is there freedom of expression, the court will say, is this a competent judgment within the, within the standards of the profession? Just like they'll do that for medical malpractice. And so if there's a doctor who thinks, still thinks arsenic should be the cure for X, and he's the only doctor who believes that, he doesn't get to defend medical malpractice on the grounds of freedom of speech. Same would happen in a university. So that's one point. Second point is uh, academic freedom also applies to universities in general when the state enacts a law of general applicability. And the argument I have made in a number of uh, <laughs> settings is that if those laws interfere with the ability of universities to set disciplinary standards, to do the job which we are the only institution in society that we, that we can do, and I tie this to a constitutional value which I call democratic competence, then we have another constitutional problem. So if the state says, you can't ever teach Marxism. It's a different problem than the economics department saying, actually, the labor theory of value is not competent for us. Okay. And Paul Geyer? All the way back. Yeah. Paul, keep your hand up. <laughs> I didn't recognize you. <laughs> We're both a little older. Uh, and my question is connected with Dave's question, and it has to do in particular with um, professional standards. Uh, or disciplinary standards that you're uh, putting a lot of weight on. Yes. Uh, but they have to be subject <coughs> to revision also. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I'm just curious if you want to say more about you know, how that happens, who gets to do that, and what the parameters of freedom on questioning the standards of the discipline yes. are. I think it's elephants all the way down is the short answer to your question. So I'll give you a concrete example that occurred to me when I was at Berkeley. I was the chair of the Academic Freedom Committee. And I got approached by uh, an architect. Um, and his complaint was that his academic freedom was being denied because the architecture department would not let students major in him. His argument was his work was so paradigm breaking in a Kuhnian sense um, that students needed to major in him in order to understand all the intellectual insight that he could bring to bear. Now, what am I supposed to do sitting in an academic with this kind of complaint? I don't know. I have to side with the experts. Bernard Williams, in his book on, on truth, uh, makes the same argument. Disciplines, in the end, have to make a judgment. Sometimes, uh, sort of rarely, they kind of get it wrong in a big way, and then they're embarrassed. Mostly, it works in a way that works. And you just, there's no outside to this because if you open, if you're open to everything, you no longer have a discipline. So disciplines have to always make judgments. Sometimes they're wrong, sometimes they're right. And then you work within the discipline. Any discipline has to grow. And at the same time, um, it can't grow by accepting anything. So it's like language, you know? It, it both is growing and it has a grammar. Great. Is that Corey? 
thanks, Robert. Wait, wait for me. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. Yeah, um, good to see you. Um, so one question is on your uh, analysis whether or not um, the, not all of the rules, but some of the rules that exist in First Amendment law might apply again. So in particular, I think you've made a very good argument against the idea that content neutrality might apply within the university. But my question is about viewpoint neutrality. Can the university punish people because of their opinions yes, specifically? Yes, all the time. And my, well, here's a kind of <laughs> couple of counter arguments. One is, when it comes to the uh, question of university self-governance and the profession, one way to see it is in terms of the discipline, but the other is the profession of being a university professor. And we at least say that we have a university that governs itself. And even if I'm in chemistry, if I give a um, opinion about some matter of university governance that's outside my area, if I'm punished for it, we think that somehow violates the idea of the university. Correct. Same when it comes to teaching, too. I would think that um, yes, there are content, you know, you can't write about a completely different topic in the constitutional law class, but if I give a criticism, uh, you know, if I'm asked a question about what my view is about the jurisprudence in a certain area and I criticize it, and even if I'm wrong, there's something odd about grading based on the correctness or lack thereof in, uh, of a particular viewpoint. So yes, it's a different logic than the logic of the formal First Amendment, but doesn't this important rule reemerge, the idea of uh, not at least not punishing people because of their opinions and that form of viewpoint neutrality. I, I think you mistake your examples don't illustrate what you're uh, going towards. So viewpoint discrimination. He's an historian up for tenure denies the Holocaust. That's his viewpoint. Doesn't get tenure. Plain case. No problem with viewpoint discrimination. The example you put on the table is a professor is being punished for something that's irrelevant to his competence. And the point about academic freedom is you're judged only on your competence, not on your views outside. And that's the principle that your first, that your first uh, example illustrates. Not an anti-viewpoint discrimination, but uh, precisely what I would suggest is judgment based only on competence. Your second example, which is about grading. So um, uh, take two examples. You have a math professor, and the student keeps saying 2 plus 2 equals 5. And, uh, uh, the student just doesn't get it right. That, that's not viewpoint discrimination. That's not knowing the rules by which you do math. Right? And there's no problem with grading for that. There's a famous case out of the AAUP where you had a sociologist who was a Marxist who gave a true-false examination. You know, the modern economists are like the ancient medieval clerics. True or false? You know, like this, like this. And he gets fired, and the AUP says, actually, these are not true, false questions. You're teaching inappropriately because it's not relevant to the standards of learning. So that's the key point, not viewpoint discrimination. It's is it relevant to a competent understanding of what teaching would inspire here? And that requires some understanding of the epistemology of the relevant subject matter. If it's math, it's one thing. If it's sociology, it's another. Viewpoint discrimination doesn't help at all as a general principle, particularly the way it's applied in First Amendment jurisprudence generally. Okay. Back there. Thank you again for that wonderful discussion. Um, I wonder, though, whether your analysis is limiting the role of the university too much. You say it's just research and education. If it was just that, then these students would, they spend most of their time outside of class, talking to each other, engaging. And remember the mission of the university, you said, was free inquiry. That was a very major part of that mission. So whereas your argument applies, I think, when we're talking about a classroom discussion or the research lab, does that apply in public events where people can discourse with one another. Yeah. And I would say it does not apply, that in, indeed civil and free speech does occur in the university outside of the strict teaching or research context that you apply to. I think that's a fair point. I mean, I was just giving the two central missions which you see in every mission statement. Now, <coughs> one can parse this even more. One can parse different spaces within a university, so you have dorm rooms. And one set of speech regulations might be appropriate in a dorm room. Another might be appropriate in a plaza. But I think the question you're asking about freedom of inquiry often goes to invited speakers and can we, and those sorts of controversies. And in, with, with respect to that, I think, what you know, I think what we need to do is parse why we're having the speakers in the first place. And when we've got that clear, then we can talk about it. So I was giving a talk at Oxford 
about four months ago. And you may not know, but in Great Britain, they have something called the no platform rule. Do you know this? Where every university has a student union, and the student union has to approve all speakers. And if they don't like it, they can no platform the speaker. And of course, they don't like anyone who's not feminist. They don't like anyone who's a racist. And this is very broadly construed. And you see a remarkable suppression of who can talk at the universities. And when I was thinking through that one, I was saying, so one, one could postulate one purpose of a university, um, let's might call this democratic education, preparing students to be democratic citizens. That's different than in a classroom. This is about how to learn to live with people who you actually don't agree with. And I would argue that's the major and if purpose that's a pur of university. Well, I, I would. You, you just said that maybe. democracy, we live under democracy, and that is the major purpose of the university, is to endorse that democracy. And only through free inquiry, necessarily in the classroom, can we achieve that. Um, there are many people who would agree with you. Dewey would agree with you, for example, this notion of democratic education. Amy Gutman might agree with you. There are other people who would say, actually, disciplinary, disciplinary um, understandings in particular classes are more important. But if that's really the function, then you'd have a different analysis. You'd have that analysis. And then you'd have to say, how do I promote the internalization of those values? And it's not the same way you would promote it if you were just in a polity. Because students don't learn those by just being put into a polity. They have to learn them. And therefore, we have the obligation to teach, not simply to act as if they were already, um, already imbued with those values necessarily because they're in a democracy. So you'd have the same issue. Great. We have Ashu. Uh, might I ask you to elaborate further on a point you very fleetingly made. You said that uh, universities are not the only sites of knowledge production. Yes. Uh, Apple produces knowledge. Bell Labs produce knowledge. Right. Uh, IBM produce, produces knowledge. So what kind of rules, what sorts of rules would apply to the knowledge produced outside the university? Well. Um, I would say, typically, if you're talking about the private sectors, they will apply the rules that most efficiently produce the knowledge that they want produced. They will say, don't research that because it's not necessary for my design for the, uh, for the company. Right? So the, the rules that apply depends on who's applying them and for what reason they're getting the knowledge outside the university. The interesting thing about the university is it's, it's the discipline, I mean, the people who are creating the knowledge in Bell Labs are the people who get the PhDs in the university. We certify them as experts. And we also certify on the outside that this is really truly a discovery, that this should be integrated into our knowledge. We do that by teaching our graduate students that, by incorporating it into the premises, the axioms of a discipline. So we are the, the central linchpin in all of this. And that's what makes us special. That's why there's no academic freedom for Bell Labs. But, but, but Apple, uh, the, the the creator of Apple did not have a degree legitimated by us, nor did the creator of Microsoft. Yeah, but the question is, in what sense did they create knowledge? And if that's knowledge, I mean, of course, a cell phone, we don't have to validate a cell phone. Cell phone validate because we're using it. We're talking about knowledge, yeah. the principles by which the screen gets touched, the principles by which it processes whatever algorithms. I don't know. I mean, that's beyond my ken. Let's right. get yeah, uh, Jim, David, and then Luther. Jim is here. Thanks. Thank you. That was clear and persuasive. And I can't resist asking you questions motivated by the election. So two questions that maybe you can help us think through. How about one? I doubt it. <laughs> uh, How about one question? All right. Um, you talked about democratic equality being the essential feature of politics yes. and knowledge generation essential to the universities. Um, is it a sign of trouble for a society when those two realms go too far apart, when um, knowledge generation is taken not only seriously but um, with some scorn in the political sphere? Thoughts yes. About that? I mean, you know, I, my, I, I wrote a book called um, I can't even remember the title. It's so bad title. You know, something like expertise, democracy, and blah blah. Academic freedom, and I mean the argument is. Democracy, expertise, academic freedom, First Amendment There you are. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you. Out of sight, out of mind, gone. So um, the argument is exactly this argument. Uh, 
And I think we're living in antinomian times. I think we're living in a time, I think what the internet has done is made everybody their own expert. I mean, talk about going to the doctor. I don't know if there's any physicians in the room, but you there know, are. before a patient goes to a doctor, they go on the internet, they know more than the doctor, the doctors go crazy. Because of course, you can't know about your disease simply by looking it up. You think you know, but you don't know what you don't know. And um, uh, this notion where everybody knows everything means that uh, as a society, we are distrusting expert knowledge and the upshot is the Tea Party and the upshot is what you're seeing, you know, what's going to happen to the EPA, et cetera, et cetera. This is a serious problem in any society that wants to predict and control its environment and to be competent in, in pragmatically engaging its environment in the modern world. Without knowledge, you can't do it. And you can't do that, therefore, without experts. And if we have no respect for expertise, we are in for very bad times. Okay. We have David and then Luther, and I think we might. Uh, thank you. Let, you open many cans of worms. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> one was uh, when you stated that uh, the function of a university is to create expert knowledge, uh, not to create, not the knowledge an artist creates or a novelist creates, right. which led me to the thought of mission creep. Uh, uh, different universities uh, have different mission statements. Uh, maybe uh, research and education is at their core, but many go beyond it, and many don't. So that uh, a, a speaker came recently to talk on this subject, mocked the Chicago statement, uh, and no one challenged him. Uh, the Chicago statement doesn't belong at Brown, it was the suggestion. Uh, he was comfortable mocking it, and we listened. Uh, at Chicago, I don't think he could have mocked the Chicago statement, because the mission at Chicago is different from the mission at Brown. When we have an art department, a studio art department, in which what we create is art, not expert knowledge, or a creative writing program where we cr create novelists, not scholars of literature. Uh, we are going beyond what you seem to identify as the mission of the university. And my suggestion is really, there isn't a mission of the university. There are many different missions of different universities. Well, it's plainly true that there are different missions for different, you're correct in that. But um, these missions have different implications. So when I was at the AUP, we had to think, what would be the rationale for academic freedom for an artist? The rationale for academic freedom is creation of new knowledge. It's very hard to say that art creates new knowledge unless you're Heidegger, you know, unless you have a very, very uh, uh, German idealist view of what knowledge is. So exactly how, exactly how are you going to rationalize that? It was a, actually a deep puzzle. And in the end, we chose to rationalize it in terms of freedom of teaching by exemplifying through their art what they wanted their students to do and to see that as a teaching function rather than, say, a production of knowledge function. But what I'm saying is as you change the, as you have different missions, you're going to actually have to think through the implications for academic freedom, for what the standards are of what you're actually producing. It's not, it's not costless to change these missions. I was just giving the irreducible two things at all universities. And the third, second thing to say to you is um, there are disciplines, but it, it, there are also different universities that specialize in different aspects of these disciplines. So economics might mean one thing at Chicago and it might mean something else at Yale. And so we have diversity within disciplines that are also located in different kinds of departments. It's like Thibault. They, they, you know, people leave for their own forms of uh, emphasis within disciplines. And we live in that tension in a discipline. And um, that's part of the complexity, the, really the joyous complexity of being in these worlds. Okay. We have Luther back there, and then we'll get Yeah, th thank you for coming again. Much appreciated. Um, obviously, issues of academic freedom require judgment. But universities, particularly private ones, have the capacity to define their answers to some of these things fairly clearly. And Brown has, in its faculty rules and regulations, a clear statement about what it considers academic freedom to cover. It's a three-part statement. The first simply says academic freedom is essential to the function of education. The second talks about faculty members and students alike 
having full freedom in teaching, learning, and research. And the third one incorporates basically, for starters, the First Amendment. Faculty members and students have the freedom of religious belief, speech, press, association and assembly, political activity in and out of the university, the right to petition, to invite speakers of their choice to the campus, and then the uh, students and faculty shall not be required to take any oath not required of other citizens, which as a former Berkeley member uh, yes. you, can, you can relate to. But so I guess my question is, um, that's pretty binding, isn't it? No. <laughs> no, it's, because, I mean, when you have a student and they give an exam and you give a bad grade and you say it's because it's incompetent or because it's bad, can the student say to you freedom of speech? I'm looking outside the classroom. Ah, well, okay. Outside the, outside the classroom moments. But your, what you read was not outside the classroom. So, I mean, actually, you see these, you see these, um, Freedom of assembly might be, but the freedom of speech you gave is not. The f academic freedom of students, I can tell you, having studied the subject, no one knows what it means. Um, it, it's generally the negative of freedom of academic freedom and responsibilities of professors. So students have the freedom to have professors not do the things that professors shouldn't do, but people don't know how to define. I've never seen a good definition of academic freedom for students, conceptually speaking. So um, the answer would be, Insofar as we're talking about uh, student performance, et cetera, freedom of speech, for the reasons I suggested, do not have application. If you're talking about outside, then we're going to have to talk about what that means. If it means freedom of speech means they get to put up, you know, lynch, lynchings or whatever and do that. And, I, you, don't, you don't permit that. You shouldn't permit that, right? So even though that would be permitted in freedom of speech in the First Amendment, there's going to be tons of difference between what we protect under the First Amendment and what you would allow a student to do, and why? Because you have a community at Brown that you need to preserve, whose trust you need to preserve. And we do not have that in the United States. And so we have different rules that would apply. So what I can suggest to you is you see a lot of rules of the kind you just read to me. California has a statute like that. It's called the Cohen Law. It says, the same speech freedoms that one would have in a park one has in the University of California, any, any state university, flatly wrong. They can say it, doesn't make it true. And if it were true, the university couldn't function. So there you are. Okay, we have one last uh, question, Megan, right here. Thank you so much. Um, I really like, enjoyed this. I have one question because it seems kind of top down and I'm, you know, at the, in the graduate level, it's we're both in the middle, we don't, we're apprentice, right? right. Um, and so it's, it, but I'm looking for my students and the students at Brown, how, are, how does this kind of regulation of speech, and kind of on, building on your question, how does this regulation of speech um, engage at, for the students, right? So how are they, how does the university police their, their speech and regulate their speech and um, through this ideology? You mean how, what are the rights of the students or what, how does the students, how do the students get regulated? Both. So like do they have the same kind of academic freedoms and rights in, outside of the classroom because they spend a lot of time outside of the classroom. Um, and then how, how, should, how can the university outside of putting a noose out, like that's just a problem. But how can the university, I don't want to say police, regulate their speech otherwise or regulate what they can do and how they engage in, in academic and intellectual freedoms? Yeah. Well, okay. So let's let's put this outside the First Amendment context because you're a private university. Let's see, what should you do? And um, it would go back to the question you were asking before, namely, what, what, do you want, what sort of student do you want to produce? For what purpose are you having the students here? How do you want them to interact? What do you want them to learn while they're here? If you want them to learn how to deal with the other, then you're going to have a broader scope of permitting people to speak. If you want to learn, if, you want, if you're worried about the trust and maintaining the trust that you need to have with your students so you can model independence of thought as opposed to just you know, having an alienated relationship with your students and you're going to regulate somewhat more. You're, that's going to intersect with the notion that freedom of speech is going to depend on where and the context in which you're speaking. So it's one thing in a dorm. It's another thing in the quad. It might be another thing when they're off campus. There's lots of ways in which specific fact patterns are going to intersect with what Brown should be doing with regard to its students in terms of regulating them. But all, the only point I want to make is 
abstract invocation of freedom of speech is not going to help you at all. The only thing that's going to help you is what do we want to achieve here by way of educating our student. You need to give content to that. And then the rules about speech regulation will follow from that. That's the only obvious point I want to make. Great. And on that point, uh, <laughs> please uh, join me in thanking Robert Post.